As inflation readings continue to come in extremely hot, it seems more likely that the Federal Reserve in the United States is going to have to continue raising rates aggressively, most likely triggering the U.S. into a recession in order to get inflation down. Today, we're going to look at 41 stock ideas that should hold up well if we have a prolonged recession and or bear market. And at the end of the video, we'll look at how this basket of stocks has held up so far this year and over the last 12 months. This video is for educational purposes only. It should not be considered investment, legal, or tax advice. It is not an offer to buy or sell any security. Past performance does not indicate future results. Investing is risky. To find this list, I used three different criteria for individual components that tend to do well in a recessionary environment. The first being Value Line's safety ratings. So Value Line has done quantitative research for decades and they publish safety ratings for each stock in their investable universe, with one being the safest and five being the riskiest. So what I did was I looked only for stocks with Value Line safety ratings of one, meaning the safest stocks in Value Line's universe. The second criteria I looked at was Morningstar's economic moat rating. Generally, companies that have a wide economic moat should be able to both survive and potentially take market share from weaker players when you go into a recession. So I only included companies that had a wide economic moat. And finally, I isolated this list to only companies that have been able to raise their dividends for at least five or more consecutive years. So Again, companies that have a track record of increasing their dividends over time tend to be companies with excess cash flow and high profitability, both of which help in a recessionary environment. They don't generally need to take out a bunch of debt or issue equity just to survive, so they tend to be in a stronger financial position. I'm going to rank all of these from highest dividend yield to lowest dividend yield. Number 41 is MasterCard. I've got here on my screen uh, price, and we're looking at over the last 10 years. So we got price here in the purple. Uh, this next line is dividend yield, so in the red is 0.6%, which is their current yield. The 3% represents their shareholder yield, meaning the dividend plus whatever they've bought back over the last 12 months. And then in this screen, we have profitability metrics. So uh, two of my favorite, return on invested capital here and return on equity in the light blue. And then finally, we have historical growth rates. So we have the three-year earnings growth, three-year sales growth, and the trailing 12-month annual dividend growth. So despite having a relatively low dividend yield of 0.6%, everything else about MasterCard is extremely impressive. Not only are they buying back, uh, looks like about 2.4% of their shares outstanding, but the return on equity and return on invested capital metrics are outstanding. And then their growth pretty much across the board uh, is high single to low double digits. So fantastic business. The main negative with MasterCard, obviously, is they're going to get hit if consumer spending slows down. Basically, they're getting a cut off of every purchase made with their cards. So if that slows down, so will their earnings and revenue growth. Next on the list, we have Roper. Unlike MasterCard, which had a higher shareholder yield than dividend yield, Roper clearly is not buying back shares. They're actually diluting it slightly via option issuance. So dividend yield 0.63 and shareholder yield 0.45. We also see much worse return on equity and return on invested capital numbers, at least relative to MasterCard. And you also see those numbers starting to trend lower, which is not a great sign. And then growth rates for earnings and sales are pretty pedestrian with dividend growth, uh, pretty impressive at 10%, but has been slowing over the years. So I won't write this one off entirely, but not a real impressive look from Roper. The next stock is insurance broker Brown & Brown. Dividend yield is 0.65%, and shareholder yield is a bit higher than that at 1.2%, so they are buying back uh, some of their shares. Return on invested capital uh, is pretty impressive for a financial company at 9%, return on equity at 15%, so solid but not spectacular numbers there. Earnings, sales, and dividend growth have all been pretty phenomenal. 
with dividend growth actually the slowest at 9%, with sales and earnings at 15% and 19% respectively. At number 38 on our list is one of my favorite uh, businesses to visit and uh, really to own, uh, which is Costco. Shareholder yield and dividend yield are pretty comparable at 0.71 and 0.87. Do note that Costco pretty regularly pays a large special dividend. Obviously, those are a little more erratic, so you can't totally depend on those, but that is a way that they return cash to shareholders. Uh, return on equity and return on invested capital, both extremely impressive at 21 and 31. And then their earnings, sales, and dividends have all grown at least 10% per year, with earnings actually pushing 16%. At number 37, we have Visa. Very similarly to MasterCard, you see shareholder yield at 3.7, so a little higher than MasterCard was at 3, and then dividend yield is also a little higher at 0.75. Return on equity and return on invested capital, both very impressive, although not as impressive as MasterCard, and then growth also not as impressive as MasterCard with kind of mid single digits for each one. At number 36, we've got MasterCard. The dividend yield is approaching 1% with this little sell-off, and then the shareholder yield is at 2.6%. Return on equity and return on invested capital are not only extremely high, but have also been improving over the last five years. The CEO, Satya Nadella, has done a fantastic job with this business, and we see that dividend growth, sales growth, and earnings growth have all been extraordinarily good. So Microsoft is a business that's firing on all cylinders at the moment. Jack Henry, uh, they do behind the scenes data work for banks. Uh, we see dividend yield at just over 1% with shareholder yield at 2.3. Return on equity and return on capital, both impressive around 25% each. And these aren't much different. So you can see basically that means they don't have a ton of debt on their balance sheet if these numbers are, are pretty close to the same. So that's encouraging. And then growth, you've got pretty solidly in the mid single digits with earnings at low double digits. Sherwin-Williams is one that obviously is going to get hit if you have housing sort of slow down and people not changing their house, you know, as, as much and not repainting the walls. But uh, an impressive company over the long run, despite the near term headwinds, uh, dividend yield 1.04 with shareholder yield around 3.8. Return on invested capital at 14%, and you can see they are pretty heavily leveraged, so you've got return on equity uh, around 69%. The growth picture here is uh, definitely worth looking into. You've got very impressive earnings and dividend growth at 23% and 22%. However, the sales growth has really been pretty sluggish, so this is something you'd want to look into if you were interested in Sherwin-Williams. At number 33, we've got Nike. Nike is obviously facing pretty big headwinds in China. The stock is off quite a bit for the year, which has pushed the dividend yield over 1%. They're also buying back shares, so you've got 2.9% total shareholder yield. Return on equity and return on invested capital, both pretty impressive. And then interestingly here, we've got a negative dividend growth number. Uh, now, I may just be completely out of the loop, but I don't think Nike actually cut their dividends, so I'm not sure exactly uh, why this is showing negative. And then sales, we got 6% and earnings growth at 15. Number 32, we have healthcare company Striker, shareholder yield and dividend yield both at 1.2%. And then you've got return on equity and return on capital at fairly pedestrian 8 and 14% respectively. Dividend growth and sales growth have both been in the high single digits with earnings growth actually negative 18% over the last three years. So again, that's a red flag that's worthy of looking into. Number 31, we've got Expeditors International. This is one that's heavily increased their buybacks. You can see that the yield at 1.3, but the buyback at a whopping 6.5%. That's very impressive. Even more impressive, really, is this return on capital, return on equity, both in the 40% range, which is incredible. And we also see extremely impressive earnings, sales, and to a lesser extent, dividend growth. Uh, obviously, the longer term trend has been more in the maybe high single, low mid digit range. So this 33 may just be an outlier. Definitely wouldn't forecast that uh, indefinitely going forward. But overall, pretty impressive metrics here from expeditors. 
Number 30, we have Republic Services. This one tends to hold up pretty well in an inflationary environment. We're not exactly building more landfills, so they've done well for the year. The yield is now down to 1.35% with a modest bump from shareholder yield at 2.3%. Return on equity at 15% and invested capital at 8 is modest but respectable. Uh, and then you've got pretty consistent but relatively low growth rates between 4 and 9%. Number 29, we have technology consulting firm Accenture. This company has been one of the most impressively consistent growers of earnings, sales, and dividends. You can see their numbers really going back as far as the eye can see are right around the 10% mark on all three metrics. Return on equity and return on invested capital, both impressive around the 30% mark. However, it is worth noting that this has been eroding over time, which is certainly not something you like to see. Uh, generally, you want to see this either increasing or, or just staying flat. Um, dividend yield is 1.4%, shareholder yield at 3.1%. Defense contractor Northrop Grumman comes in at number 28. Stock is up for the year, one of the rare stocks that's up. Uh, obviously, with the war in Ukraine, this is benefiting significantly from that. You've got a 1.5 dividend yield and a 4.5 shareholder yield. Return on equity and return on invested capital, both very impressive. And then you've got an explosion in earnings up 33% over the last three years. But probably the fundamental growth rate looks more like the sales and dividend growth at between 6 and 8.5%. Number 27 is another trash provider, waste management. Stock is also up for the year. You've got a dividend yield of 1.5, shareholder yield of 3.4. Better measurements than Republic Services when it comes to return on invested capital at 12% and return on equity at 30%. And then you've got earnings have been slowing for the last couple of years, actually slightly negative for the last three years, uh, with sales and dividends both in the mid single digits. At number 26, we have Walmart. A 1.6% dividend yield and a 4.5% shareholder yield is pretty impressive. We got return on equity numbers at solid but unspectacular 11 and 17. The problem here is the sales and dividend growth have been pretty anemic over the years, now coming in at between 2 and 4%. Uh, this earnings growth at 29% shows that they've clearly done a good job with margins, but that can't continue indefinitely. So growth, I think, is the main red flag here with Walmart. At number 25, we have ADP. They're a payroll processor, so benefiting if employment increases. This is another one with impressive earnings and dividend growth, both pretty consistently hovering around 10%. The return on invested capital and return on equity are both extremely impressive at 38% and 66%. Shareholder yield is 3.7, while dividend yield is 1.7. Number 24, we have beloved chocolate maker Hershey, another stock that's up for the year. Dividend yield at 1.9, shareholder yield modestly higher at 2.6. Return on invested capital is incredibly high. People apparently love Reese's and are willing to pay a lot of money for it. So 23 and return on equity at 63. Pretty consistent sales, earnings, and dividend growth between 5 and 8%. McCormick is a spice producer. Shareholder yield and dividend yield are basically exactly the same at 1.8%. Return on equity and return on invested capital, both relatively pedestrian, but again, the bigger concern is this long-term trajectory down. Uh, it's certainly not something you'd like to see, so look into that before buying this one. Uh, the earnings, sales, and dividend growth have historically been in the mid to high single digits, but you do have earnings growth at negative seven, so again, a couple red flags here for McCormick. Analog Devices is another technology stock that makes the list the shareholder yield is one of the most impressive on this entire list. They've really ramped it up now, sitting at 7.1%. Dividend yield is at 2.05%. Return on equity and investments are not too inspiring here at 7% and 8% each. And again, we see negative earnings growth, which is a bit troubling. But, you know, dividends has been pretty impressive at 12%. But I think I would question how, the, how that can continue with fundamental growth being, you know, so weak. Number 21, we have Honeywell, an industrial conglomerate with a dividend yield of 2.1 and a shareholder yield of 5.2. And you can see this has pretty consistently been in the 5% range. So this business is definitely buying back a ton of their stock. 
return on equity at 28% and return on capital at 14%, both pretty impressive. But you do have very lackluster earnings and sales growth, even dividend growth at 4% is not great. So growth seems to be an issue with Honeywell. Uh, dividend stalwart McDonald's here at number 20. The dividend yield is now 2.17 with the shareholder yield at 3.8%. Return on equity is not even on the screen at 521, largely because of such a massive buyback program that they've done over the years. Basically, that subtracts from equity and makes that number look extremely high. Uh, returns on capital are more reasonable here at 16.5%. Growth has been solid, but not spectacular. Low single digits for sales and dividends with earnings trending around 10%. Number 19, we have consumer discretionary coffee maker Starbucks. This is another one where return on equity is off the screen at 211%. Obviously, these massive buybacks here from 2018 to 2020 really cranked up that return on equity number. Return on invested capital still impressive at 28.5%. I think the big concern here is you do have slowing sales and earnings growth, both 3 and 5.5% over the last three years with dividends close to 10% growth. Obviously, this one has trouble in China, but also if you get a big slowdown in consumer spending, I doubt many people are going to be uh, trying to keep their expensive coffee habits. So this could be one that has some trouble if you do get into a really bad recession. Number 18, Railroad Union Pacific. Consistently impressive shareholder yield at 6.7%, and this has been uh, really up here for, for years. 2.3% dividend yield is pretty respectable, and then you've got return on equity at over 50%, very impressive, and return on invested capital around 17 Basically, this is a monopoly right in their particular region, just like the other railroads. Earnings growth and dividend growth, both around the 10% mark, and then you've got a actually slowdown in sales. So something else to watch out for. This will benefit if gas prices go up, making it more competitive to transport goods via rails instead of trucks. So that's certainly favorable for Union Pacific. Number 17, we have Colgate Palmolive. This is another one with pretty anemic growth rates. You see that the fastest growth we see is from sales at 4%. Everything else is very uh, weak or, or negative when you look at earnings. Uh, but you do have very impressive return on equity at 615 and return on invested capital at 25%. So very impressive, profitable, but basically no growth type of a business. Shareholder yield at 39 is pretty impressive and dividend yield at almost 2.5%. Next on our list is Emerson Electric with a 2.5 dividend yield, 3.8% shareholder yield, and then a 32% return on equity and 17% return on invested capital. Again, problem here is growth rates are basically non-existent at one, one and a half, and three. Another dividend classic, Procter & Gamble, comes in at number 15 at a 2.6% dividend yield, 5% shareholder yield, the return on equity and return on invested capital, also pretty impressive. And then what you see here is unlike other staples, you've actually had some pretty decent growth at Procter & Gamble with earnings obviously an outlier at 59.5%, but at sales and dividends coming in at 6 and 8%. So for a consumer staple stock, I think that's very impressive fundamental growth for P&G. Uh, we'll see if they can keep that up over the next couple of years, but this should hold up pretty well uh, in a bear market. Obviously, one of the most iconic consumer staples companies in U.S. history. At number 14, we have home improvement retailer Home Depot, one of the best ran consumer discretionary stocks. Shareholder yield is one of the most impressive on the list at 6.8%. Dividend yield is getting up there at 27 As the stock has fallen, the yield is obviously uh, gone up quite a bit. And then return on equity is, I think, the highest on the list at 1,464. So unbelievable numbers, 40% return on invested capital. So that's very impressive. And then the growth rates have just been really incredible at 10%. 12% and 17%. Obviously, they've benefited to a pretty large extent from COVID just with the work from home remodeling. So that may not continue moving forward. But 
A very impressive fundamental picture here for Home Depot. At number 13, we have another defense contractor, Lockheed Martin. Dividend yield is 2.7% with the shareholder yield over 7%. Return on equity and return on invested capital at 52% and 25%. And then pretty consistent growth around the 8% mark on sales, earnings, and dividends. Surprisingly, Coca-Cola does not make this list, but its competitor, Pepsi, does, maker of sugary soda water. Uh, not much of a buyback, but they do have a 2.8% dividend yield right now and impressive profitability metrics at 55% return on equity and 18.5% return on capital. Dividends and sales have been growing at the mid single digits with earnings actually negative 14.5 over the last three years. At number 11, we have another dividend portfolio favorite, which is Johnson & Johnson. 2.8% dividend yield is getting, you know, pretty attractive. Not much of a buyback program, but a little bit. 3.4% shareholder yield. Return on equity and return on invested capital both pretty pretty solid 18 and 25%. And then you have steady sales and dividend growth around the 5% mark. At number 10, we have Texas Instruments with a 2.8% dividend yield and a 4% shareholder yield. We also have incredible numbers from return on invested capital at 45%, return on equity at 68 and even more impressively is the trajectory of these numbers over time. The growth numbers are also pretty impressive with earnings and dividends both growing at around 13% with sales at 5%. We've got Bristol Myers coming in at number nine, a massive shareholder yield at 8% with a dividend yield over three. Profitability numbers are solid but not spectacular at 10 and 19. And then you've got pretty wild uh, differences here. Sales are up 27. Dividends, again, I'm not sure why this is showing negative, but maybe specials or something like that. Uh, and then you've got basically flat earnings growth. So this is wild. Uh, definitely something to, to take a look at uh, before buying Bristol Myers. UPS comes in at number eight. Again, very impressive profitability numbers at 30 and 80, respectively. Dividend yield at 3.2, shareholder yield at 4.1. And then the growth has obviously benefited from the continued trend to shipping. The dividend growth has been a bit anemic at 1%, so it might be something to, to take a look at before investing in UPS. But earnings growth and sales growth have both been pretty impressive. At number seven, we have Comcast. The stock has been absolutely pounded for the year. The dividend yield is now up to 3.2%, which I think is the highest it's been uh, over its 10 year history. And the shareholder yield, I think this is the highest in the list at 10%, which is really wild. So impressive numbers here, chart looks awful. Profitability metrics are mediocre, to say the least, eight and a half percent, nine percent return on invested capital and 15% return on equity. And then earning sales and dividends have all been growing uh, between six and nine percent. Kellogg comes in at number six with a 3.3% dividend yield and a 3.7% shareholder yield. Return on equity at 40% with return on capital around 15%. And then again, we've got another consumer staple with pretty sluggish sales, earnings, and dividend growth numbers. Coming in in the top five is pharmaceutical Amgen at a 3.4 dividend yield and a 10.7, so actually higher than Comcast, uh, on shareholder yield. Return on equity is 123% with return on capital at 19. And then we've got another one with negative earnings growth, sluggish sales growth, but impressive dividend growth. So that obviously cannot continue if sales and earnings don't pick it up just a bit. But at a 3.4% dividend yield, you know, you don't need a ton of growth to make that uh, look pretty attractive. Cisco comes in at number four, another one with just really anemic growth numbers the highest of which is 2.7, uh, so that's not, not really encouraging. But you do have impressive profitability numbers and a dividend yield of 3.5 and a shareholder yield of 7.7. 7. So really, if they can just continue to buy back shares and pay dividends, I mean, you should make uh, something close to 7% as long as you don't overpay. But again, you've got absolutely no growth. Pfizer, probably the biggest benefactor from COVID. Uh, so you've got some really kind of crazy growth numbers here. But dividend growth has been pretty sluggish at 2.6%. But it's been extremely profitable, particularly as of late. Again, you see this nice upward trajectory. How much of that's from COVID? I'm not sure. But 
You've got return on capital 25 and return on equity 37. The dividend yield at three and a half and the shareholder yield at four two. And number two, we have CME, dividend yield at 3.7. However, red flag, shareholder yield is lower, right? So they're actually issuing equity probably to, you know, the C-suite or whatever. I don't know what the explanation is here, but shareholder yield at 2.4, which is not uh, real inspiring. And then you've got pretty weak return on invested capital and return on equity numbers. This is a financial, so you have to take that into consideration, but uh, not a great look here. And then, you know, unspectacular growth numbers, but, you know, decent uh, if you look at dividends at six and earnings at eight and a half. But I think these two charts here, profitability and this equity issuance uh, is not real encouraging. And the number one stock on the list is 3M. Again, this is ranked by dividend yield, certainly not an endorsement uh, for me. They've got some major legal troubles and you can see that the stock is basically not gone anywhere uh, since, uh, what is this, going back to 2015. Uh, they do have a pretty big buyback program at 7.7 and a big dividend yield at close to 5%. I don't know if that's going to be able to continue. I think the market's starting to kind of question whether that's sustainable given their other legal issues. Uh, again, you see a troubling picture when it comes to return on invested capital and return on equity. Both of those, particularly return on capital, have been falling for the last five or six years uh, and are now down to 14%, which is you know mediocre. Return on equity is still solid at 29. Uh, and then also you've got basically very little growth, particularly very little dividend growth at just 0.7%. So how are these stocks holding up so far this year? Let's take a look at that. Obviously, past performance does not suggest future performance. And this portfolio is not in real time. I just created it as of today. So maybe one of these metrics didn't apply a year ago. You know, all that uh, is something to consider. Most of these metrics are fairly stable. So I don't know that there'd be too much of an issue there, but just keep that in mind. So here we have a breakdown of how each of these stocks has done over the last year compared with the S&P 500, which is here. Uh, negative 10.7%. The dividend growth index, this is using VIG, is down 6.3% total return. And then li this list, uh, just combined equal weight, is down 2.1%. So this has held up better than both the average dividend growth and the average stock, basically the S&P 500. And if you look at compared with the broader market, this has been a pretty impressive gap, really. So if the market continues to fall, I would expect this list should hold up pretty well. Uh, you can see the dispersion of some of these names. Uh, so the worst performer has been Comcast. It's now down over 42, 41% uh, over the last year. And then the best performer has been Northrop Grumman. It's up 41%. And then you can see the dispersion of all of these. So Again, I'm not recommending that you buy any of these. I just wanted to share the list just in case there were some stock ideas here that you might be interested in looking more into. To find this data, I use Portfolio123, which is my favorite data provider uh, that I have. It's very robust, and you can do basically just about anything you want with it. This is how I get my shareholder yield data and manage my coffee can portfolio. You can also do back testing and screeners and all kinds of things in here. So you can actually try this for free. Uh, $9 gets you three weeks uh, free trial. And after your trial, it works out to about $25 per month or $2.99 per year for retail investors. So check it out for three weeks. $9 is a fantastic deal. I'll put a link in the description below. Uh, if you want to take advantage of that. Full disclosure, I do get a referral fee from Portfolio123, but this is something that I personally subscribe to and pay uh, with my own money. Uh, this is not sponsored by them in any way, shape, or form. I just love the product, think it's very helpful, and think it's absolutely worth uh, 25 bucks a month to take advantage of some of their features. If you're a member of the channel or a supporter on Patreon, uh, be sure to check out my most recent member exclusive video, which was the S&P 500 valuation model updated for September 2022. And also I'm going to be posting my October Q&A session in the next couple of weeks. So if you want to get a question in for that, 
uh, let me know on Patreon or in the YouTube member section. You can also send me a direct message on Patreon if that's easier for you. Just let me know that you want me to review it in the upcoming question and answer video. Thanks for watching and I will look forward to seeing you in the next video.